thank you for allowing us to be in your house this morning. I pray that you give us your blessing as we look into your word. Help us to understand it. And by the Spirit of God, I pray that you'd help us to not only understand it in our minds, but I pray it will grip our hearts and that we'll be changed by it and we'll be uh, encouraged by it and we'll become fruitful by it, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the things that you're teaching us. And I pray you'll bless the day as we have the dedication later on. I thank you for the fathers who are here present. We pray you bless each one. And we pray that you'll give us a great day in your house. We ask you these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, we're on family structure. And uh, we dealt with the husband being an authority. And uh, two weeks ago, we dealt with, and, and three weeks ago, that men would struggle in dominion responsibility. And today, oh, I forgot to put this thing on. Today, we're going to be on a... Uh, uh, continuing on letter E, the women desiring dominance, we went through the first part of that last week up to Titus chapter 2, and we'll continue on here. So we'll begin with Titus 2 this morning, Titus chapter 2. And we're dealing with the fact that the women will desire dominance. This is a part of the curse. This is not something that should be new to any of us, but it is something that we have to be reminded of. And if we don't remind ourselves of it, then we tend to fall into a bad behavior on it and at least a bad mindset on it. But letter E, women will desire dominance. And in Titus chapter 2, he says in verse 1 to Titus, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And the, if you'll notice, there should be a colon there after doctrine, because these are the things that become sound doctrine, or the things that are fim, fitting or seemly or that go along with sound doctrine. So we have the doctrine from God's Word, we have the instruction that God's Word gives us, but then we have the practice that goes along with it. And the two cannot be separated from one another. And if we separate them from one another, then we don't have either. We don't either have sound practice because it's not, it's not rooted in God's word. And if we don't have practice that results from, God, from what we find in God's word, then it's ineffective. It's ineffectual. It's like uh, faith without works, as James chapter 2 tells us. So we must have both. And that's what he says here to, to T Titus, who was the pastor at Crete. He said, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And then he gives us the colon there to help us to realize, of course, that wasn't in the uh, original text, but the, the grammar is there for us to recognize what follows is that which becomes sound doctrine. So it is correct in the English for us there, that the ages men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. And this is God's will for the aged men, men who are older, men who are not just adults, but have already been through the, the trenches of raising children and of guiding their house. And then it would extend, of course, to younger men. This, the idea is that they're affecting the younger men with their behavior. The, younger, the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. And we see the connection there to them as he comes down to uh, verse 6. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So between the old, the old men, the aged men, and the young men, sandwiched between those verses are this are these verses on the women. In verse 3, he says that the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So he gave instruction to the aged women that regarding their behavior. And he says in verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So we have this challenge here for the older women to be teaching the younger women. The sad fact of the matter is that many, and even in independent Baptist church, churches, many older women, I'm not saying our church, but many independent Baptist churches, many older women do not, have not lived this out in their lives in the first place. So they can't teach the younger women because they've not le lived it out in their life. And he says in verse uh, four, or excuse me, at the end of verse three, he says, teachers of good things. The word there for teachers of good things is, is uh, teaching like I am teaching right now, but he changes it in verse four, that they may teach, that they may urge the young women to be sober. 
So there, the impact of a woman's teaching, a godly woman's teaching, is to be to teach specifically women, younger women, and to teach them what? To teach them about their home life, to teach them about being domestic, to teach them about their homemaking responsibilities. And if you look at the list here in Titus 2, that's all of those things. Uh, so if you go out in a broader Christendom, you'll find all kinds of women's Bible conferences and uh, women's uh, meetings and all of these things. And I know, I know that the women have a great time at those things. I don't, I don't uh, argue against that. I don't argue against the fact that sometimes a woman may teach something that's really good from the scriptures. But the question is, does that honor the scriptures? Does that honor the scriptures? And the Lord gives here, he gives the guidelines and the parameters for what a woman ought to be teaching and who she ought to be teaching. So it should be, and, and who ought to be teaching all of these things. By the way, many of the women's conferences, it's a younger woman that's uh, preaching at those things. And that's not what he says here. He says the older woman, the aged women. So how old do you have to be to be aged? Don't ask me, okay? I'm not, <laughs> but uh, not young, okay? Not young is the answer. Not young. So uh, you, we have to, that, that, that's a little bit relative depending on situations and uh, life experience and all of those things, but the difference is that it's not young. And we all know what young is versus aged. So uh, um, my pastor used to like to say that the, he doesn't know where on certain issues, sometimes you don't know where the seashore ends and the sea begins, but he knows when he's out in the middle of the ocean. And I, so that's where we're at on this, okay? We, we, there's not an age given to us, you know, 45, 50, 60. There's not an age given to us, but we know, you know, 25 is not aged, right? right. So we have, a, we have to come to a, a biblical pattern on the thing, and then we'll be uh, on the right track at least, okay? Uh, the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as become with holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And then he says that they may teach the young women... And here's what it is, to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, uh, again, this is one of those passages that I'll preach on in the future, but I want to focus on verse 5, what he says there, to be obedient to their own husbands. To be obedient to their own husbands. Uh, in other words, this is something that the flesh is going to tempt you against. All of these things the flesh tempts us against doing, right? And as we saw from the beginning with the curse, thy desire shall be to thy husband. So this just follows right along with the biblical pattern on all of these things. Over and over and over again, the Lord instructs, instructs ladies regarding submission and regarding obedience. And I'm not saying that because I'm get, I get to be the one to tell you what to do. Or because your husband is the one who gets to be the boss of the home. That's not, these are God-given responsibilities. And sometimes being the boss is not the fun thing. Sometimes having to make the hard decisions is not a fun thing. And I'll even mention that during the morning service today for the fathers. But uh, I should say sometimes, a lot of times, because there's a great responsibility that goes along with that. <clears throat> but God's given that to men and not to ladies. So we have to be careful about our, our fulfilling of our roles in every area of our lives, whether it's our personal life and our home, whether it's in the church or whether it's in society, even we have to be careful about how we behave, and the things that we encourage women to be involved in, and the things that they are involved in. What's the, what's the pattern for us to follow? Uh, the scriptural pattern is the one. And he says that the older women are to be teaching the younger women to be obedient to their own husbands. I've said it before. I'll say it again uh, before this life is through, uh, unless the Lord takes me this afternoon. But uh, uh, I, I've seen, seen a, many, many times where there's an older woman an aged woman in the church, someone who was raised in the church, sometimes even pastors' wives, and uh, in, in group settings with young women or in one-on-one -on -one settings with younger women who are struggling with this idea of submission to their husband or obedient to, obedience to their husband, and they'll complain about their husband to this, other, this older woman. And the older woman takes the side of the young woman and says, how dare he do that? You should get your pound of flesh back because he's doing that, and here's how you deal with that, and I can't believe he would do such a thing. And they call into question <clears throat> husbands and pastors and all, all sorts of things without having all the information, just what is being fed to them right away. And that's not what God says for older women to do. God says for the older women to tell the younger women that you need to go home and love your husband. So I challenge you older ladies in, in Bible Baptist Church, let it not be said that the older women uh, allowed a younger woman to vent about her husband without pushing her back to her husband. And this is God's, this is God's way. So 
Older ladies, you have a responsibility. Say, uh, are you an older lady? You, you, you answer that in your own heart. You, ha you have a responsibility before the Lord to, when that, that uh, complaint comes against the authority that God has placed in their lives, that you push them back to their authority. Why don't you ask your husband? Ask your, hu ask your father. Uh, why don't you go home and love your husband? Love your father. Why don't you go home and be obedient to your husband? Be submitted to your father. These are the things that the older women are to be teaching the younger women. And we do it that for obedience sake because the scripture tells us to. But we can also see the practical fruit of not doing that, can we not? We can see the, the negative downward trend that has been occurring in society for the last over 100 years what, since we've been pushing this stuff. Because now women want to be, quote, empowered. They want to be empowered. They want to be furthered as if pushing to the home is not furthering. It's restricting. And according to the world's mindset, that is restricting. But according to God's mindset, that's what he, that, that was the restriction that he set up where you can be most fruitful. Can, can, a, can, can a horse be most fruitful swimming across a lake? No. A horse or a cow is most fruitful plowing in the field because that's what they're suited for. That's what they're fitted for. Can a fish plow the field? No. Uh, Fish can't even survive out of water. But they have, their, they have their guidelines. They have their guardrails that God established in their creation. And the same is true with men and women. And when we get out of our proper field of work, then we begin to diminish things. We begin to diminish things. And our fruit, fruit is diminished. Our fruitfulness is diminished. And our blessing is diminished from the Lord. So older women, aged women, your responsibility is to tell the younger women to go and love their husband. And say, well, I don't have all the information. It's not your responsibility to get all the information. If there's, if there's violence of some type occurring, then the, your responsibility is to uh, tell them to report to the police. Okay? We're not talk, I'm not talking about uh, uh, assault or violence. But when it comes to just normal relationships, and he's rude and he's mean, you married him. And that's the way he is. Your best recourse is not to go vent to an older woman. Your best re recourse is to follow the word of God. And that would be, try 1 Peter chapter 3. What does God say is the best way to win a husband who is not following the word? He's not obeying the word. And the best way is to do what Titus chapter 2 says and go home and be obedient to your husband, to be submitted to your husband, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. That's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 3. So you do have recourse, but your recourse is not what we normally think it is. Now, does that mean that you should never seek the counsel, uh, younger ladies, or you should never give counsel, older ladies, on what it means to submit to your husband and what it means? No, this is what this is telling us. It's not just simply go home and obey your husband, although that might be all that is necessary and might be exactly what the Lord ordered for the situation, but it might be how have you loved your husband this week? Or how have you obeyed your husband this week? Or how have you been disobeying your husband this week? Let me help you with those things, and I'll counsel you through that. And that's how I'll direct you to, the, to obeying the Word of God, and that's how I'll direct you so that you can have the best marriage that you could possibly have. So older women, it's a challenge for you, straight from God's Word. This is what you ought to be teaching the younger women. By the way, the older women, I do not believe, should be teaching through 1 Timothy, or teaching through Philippians, or teaching through a passage of uh, Scripture uh, in bulk. We don't see any pattern for that in the Scriptures. Someone said, well, the women can have the gift of teaching, just as men can. That's true, over in Romans chapter 12. These are not restricted to men, men versus women, these spiritual gifts. He says in verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Can, can ladies have the gift of prophecy? Certainly they can. I know some in this room who do. My own wife does. Poor me. Uh, but where, does she preach in the church? No. She has her role to fill. She prophesies in other ways. She prophesies on an individual level. She prophesies to people. She prophesies to me, which is helpful to me. Even when I don't like it, it's helpful to me. Uh, these are things these, she has to find how God wants her to do that. Can a woman have the gift of teaching? Yes, she can. Verse 7, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. 
So can a woman have the gift of teaching? Absolutely, but how is she going to teach and what is she going to teach? So she might be a gifted teacher, but she needs to find the parameters which God has set for her in her teaching. Okay? So I hope we're clear on that. If you have questions about that, we can talk about that. But this is the, this is the, the way the Lord's word follows. And we don't have any place in the New Testament, not, not one instance where a woman was uh, teaching, even teaching women, expositorily through the scriptures. We do have these challenges, though, for women to teach women regarding their, their role. All of the things that go on with their role. By the way, one of them is being sober-minded. You look across the landscape today, you find a lot of unsober women. The young women are not sober. A lot of the, the aged women are not sober. They live their life to see what, uh, what thing they can go enjoy, what friends they can spend time with, uh, what pretty thing they can do to their uh, appearance, uh, what clothes and jewelry they can buy and enjoy. I'm not saying any of those things are wrong in and of themselves, but the focus is on those. And if I can't have those things, then I don't have happiness and I don't have joy and I don't have blessedness. That's not a sober mindset. Or I want to, uh, we have the attitude of telling young ladies, you can do whatever you want to do. The world is before you. But this is not what God says. So if you have a daughter, I have a daughter, and I'm not going to tell her you can do whatever you want to do. I'm going to tell her you can do whatever you want to do that is in the will of God, which is established for us by God's word. In those guidelines, you can do whatever you want, whatever you want to do. But we have to follow the, follow the right guidelines. We don't, I don't encourage women to just do whatever they want to do and get involved in whatever business they want to and all of these things. This is not a, this is not a Bible way. God says he has roles there. And we, uh, so uh, aged women, you can teach younger women to be sober. All of those things, we'll go over that someday. All right, uh, so women will desire dominance. Go over to 1 Peter 3, which we've referenced often and <clears throat> preached through. Last year, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Right, right away again, we have this, this assault against women dominance, female dominance. God says it over and over again in all of these passages. He details the struggle that women have regarding desiring dominance. Just as he details the struggle that men have regarding passivity and not taking their dominion responsibility. Titus, or 1 Peter chapter 3, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. And look at uh, verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, which is in, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And he says in verse 5, For after this manner, in the old time, the, women, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, Notice it, being in subjection to their own husbands. So holy women are subjected women. So that doesn't sound very nice. No, that's what God says. That's not what I said. Holy women are subjected women. The holy women are submitted women. Now, uh, the holiness of a woman is not only predicated upon her level of submission, but that is such a chief part of it. And you can have a woman who is spiritual in a lot of ways. She's a holy woman in a lot of ways, but she's not submitted. And so she tarnishes that holy woman appearance. It's tarnished because she's not submitted in this area or in this area in this area. So it's a lifelong pursuit for you ladies to be submitted to the Lord. And when you do that, you'll be the true ornament. You'll, you'll have that true ornament. They adorn themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. And it's, it's an adorning for you. It's a beautifying thing. So you think, not you, but I'm speaking to women. You think, women, that uh, I will be ador I'll be beautified by adorning myself in power and authority. Or by adorning myself in riches and wealth. Or by adorning myself in assertiveness and order, uh, control. But the Lord says, no, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trust in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham. Returning again to the idea of obedience and submission, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So, again, as we've said many times, I don't think the Lord is telling you ladies to call your husband Lord. He's detailing the attitude that Sarah had regarding her husband. Her, her attitude regarding him is 
her, uh, what you ever done, have you ever done a word association? They will save a word and you're supposed to think of the, the experience or the picture or the color or whatever it is that comes to mind. When Sarah heard husband or when Sarah heard Abraham, she thought Lord. That was her attitude. That was her word association in Sarah's life. And it was an amazing thing. And the Lord lifts her up as a holy woman because of that. Does Sarah have uh, failings of faith in her life? Sure, she did, just as Abraham did. But uh, she was a holy woman. And God praises for that, her for that. And God used her to bless the world in her life. <clears throat> Praise God for that. All right, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Well, here we have it again. And this is what is fit in the Lord. So a woman out of submission is not fit in the Lord. That is not fitting. It is not suitable. God says for a woman to be out of submission. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Uh, we want to do the things that are appropriate, don't we? Certainly we do in life, but we want to do that which is appropriate in our homes as God's people and in our church. So God says, as it is fit in the Lord, wives, submit yourselves under, under your own husbands. Ephesians chapter 5, familiar passage, Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 21, he says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And this does not teach mutual submission where men ought to submit to women. I've heard that many times, and that's wrong. That's not true. What he's saying here is that, uh, or, or the next verses would count, contradict it, which the Lord doesn't do that. So he says in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That is, wherever you ought to be submitting yourself, that's where you should be submitting. Where God's instruction for you to be submitted is, be submitted in that area and in that place in your life. And if you'll do that, then you'll be living in the fear of God. See, ultimately, all of our submission is submission to God. When I submit to the government, I'm submitting to God. When church members submit to their pastor, they're submitting to God. When wives submit to their husbands, they're submitting to God. When children submit to their parents, they're submitting to God. They're doing it in the fear of God. This is, this is, this is the authority structure of God. And it is the dem when we obey it, it's a demonstration of our fear of God. You ever heard someone say, well, that, that person is a God-fearing man or a woman. That's good. Are they really? This is part of the fear of God, is our behavior of submission. And the cultural attitude of husband and wife equality, male and female equality, <clears throat> which, by the way, of course, we believe in equal value. One is not more valuable than the other, but when it comes to authority, they don't have equal authority. And the, the world equates authority with value. And we don't do that. The Lord, the Lord uses authority as a role. Is, is God the Son any, any less valuable than God the Father? <laughs> no. But God the Son submitted to God the Father. So you see this played out in humanity. Uh, but when the culture goes against that, the culture is not fearing God. And do you see this as we have, have it uh, played out before us? All of this stuff going on right now in Juneteenth, June, the month of June, Gay Pride Month, and Juneteenth that's celebrated. And all, all of these things are, uh, are a fly in the face of God Almighty. They operate completely outside of the fear of God. How do we get to those places? We get to those places by not doing something like Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says. Where we are to be submitted to God's roles and to God's circumstances, to God's guardrails, guidelines for us, then we must be submitted in those things. Otherwise, we get outside of the fear of God and it devolves. And it gets further and further out of line over time. So we get back to the scriptures and we obey the scriptures and we have fruitfulness and we have that which is right. We have a society that is God-fearing. And that is God honoring and that is structured correctly. All right. Uh, uh, continuing on there. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Here we have it again. As it is fit in the Lord, here it is as unto the Lord. Remember, all submission is ultimately to the Lord. Whether a man submits in, in a place where he's supposed to be submitted or whether a woman submits where she's supposed to be submitted, it's all ultimately to the Lord. We have to be submitted to the Lord as unto the Lord. So you say, well, my husband is not worthy of my submission. No doubt he's not. I'm not worthy of my wife's submission. 
But she does it because she honors the Lord. She does it as unto the Lord. And that's a, that, by the way, that is a rebuke to me sometimes when I have not behaved as the Lord, and yet I see her behaving submitted. And then I realize, wait a second, I've got to, I got to go, I got to go uh, back to the drawing board of my life here. This is not right. I should not have spoken that way. I should not be acting this way. I should be more considerate of her thought on this than I have been because she's submitting as unto the Lord because I know she's not submitting because she wants to be submitted right now. But she's submitting as unto the Lord. And that's a rebuke to me. Am I behaving like Christ? As he gives the challenge to the husbands in this same passage, verse 25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We'll get into that next week, the Lord willing. But he says this, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. We saw that also in 1 Corinthians 11. He talks about the husband being the head of the wife, uh, and Christ is the head of the church. He says here in verse 23, The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So we have a parallel here. He draws this this parallel, an example for us. Christ is the head of the church, is he not? So does the church have the authority then to overrule the Lord Jesus Christ or to take away the glory from the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. And if we do that, then the Lord will write Ichabod over our church sign, and we are done for. We have to give the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And that the Lord makes a parallel. It's an example. It's an illustration. He, does the same, he wants the same thing in a home. He wants the same thing in your home. The husband is the head of the wife. So the wives, the, the ladies should never uh, overrule their husband, or they should never take the glory from their husband, so to speak. They should not do that. Say, have you ever done that? Probably you have. Should you do that? No. So what do you do? You get right about it, just like the husband has to get right. The wife has to get right. Remember that your flesh is pulling against this. That's just the way it is because of the curse. It's reality. But you have the new man along with the old man, and you have the the ability to choose to do the right. And how they're responding, what they're doing, that you, you know they should be doing it a different way. It's not going to change anything if you get out of God's way for you. You get out of God's way for you, you're not going to solve the problem. You're just going to make it worse. You're just going to make the problem worse. We have to follow God's way. Therefore, verse 24, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. And we put a lot of weight on husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church, and we should. We should not do that. But we don't put enough weight on wives submitting to their husbands as the church is to submit to Christ. We don't put enough emphasis on that, and we need to. Put the, the same emphasis is on both. And as our, as our responsibility as church members, that's our, our, uh, our, our most near responsibility as a church is to be subject to Christ. And so, wives, your most near responsibility is to be subject to your husbands in everything. Now, if he tells you to go sin, that's not that's not right. You don't you don't have to do that in every situation of authority. See, we have a perfect authority, ultimate authority, which is God. So he never tells us to do the wrong thing. He never instructs us to sin. There are times when a government may instruct you to sin, and at that point, it is your responsibility to say no. And the same thing is true with the husband and wife relationship. Your husband tells you to go rob a bank. That's the easiest low fruit uh, illustration. Uh, You can be a Bonnie and Clyde there. Uh, If the husband tells you, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go rob a bank. Okay. Or uh, or whatever you can, you have to think of the thing. And, And a good chance your husband hasn't asked you to do something that's sinful that he, 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 he doesn't, that's not usually his M.O. Now, if he says, hey, let's not go to church anymore, you should try to fight against that. If he says, hey, let's not tithe anymore, you should try to push back against that, uh, uh, as, uh, if he's a, a, a Christian man, that is, okay? So there's, there's, a, uh, there's, there's, thing, there's areas where we, you should push back. There's areas where you should just absolutely say no. Uh, I'm not going to be involved in promiscuity or something like that. Not, no, I'm not going to do that. I will not do that. That would violate what God's instruction to me is in First Peter chapter 3, to have chaste, pure conversation lifestyle. 
Okay, but um, we don't put enough weight on that. Verse 24, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. How many areas is the church to be subject to Christ in? Every area. And we, don't have, we don't have the liberty to be excused from any point of obedience to God's word, to the word of Christ, or to our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is true for the ladies. There's no situation in which you have the uh, uh, allowance to come out from submission to your husband. Say, this is heavy. Yeah, I know, because we're so used to not, this not being our mindset. We teach on it. We all know it. We've heard the verses before, but we kind of gloss over it. We move on, and we don't really, we don't really uh, dwell on it. But God wants us to dwell on these things, for them to be something that is demonstrable in our lives, something that is uh, appointed, something that is not, not, a, not just as dull in our lives, but something that's an emphasis point in our lives. If it was not meant to be an emphasis point in our lives, then the Lord would not have repeated it this many times in Scripture. And this is not all of the times or all of the examples. This is just a few of them. But there are many. We saw Genesis, 1 Timothy, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 7 details that, by the way, also. Titus 2, 1 Peter 3, and Ephesians and Colossians both. This is a bunch of passages regarding this thing. That should tell us, that should uh, inform us that this is not a... Not a uh, ancillary issue. It's a core issue. It's a core issue of our life. We take, take, well, be in church. Yes. Amen. Everybody should be in church. That's a core issue, right? Husband and wife roles and male and female roles is a core issue because of how many times the Lord speaks uh, to it in our lives. All right, we're going to be finished here this morning. Father, I thank you for how you, you give us your instructions. I thank you for your women here who have been submitted and are submitted. I pray you bless them for that. And we know that ultimately that's the place of your protection and the place of your blessing. So I pray you'd encourage them in that. Help them to see the value that you place on their lives and the virtue that you see in them as they fulfill your roles. The beauty that exudes from them when they are following your word, uh, letting the word of Christ dwell in, them, dwell in them richly. And we pray that you'll help them be, to be strengthened in the might of your power by obeying your word. And I pray you strengthen us as families, as homes, marriages, and as our church, and the influence that we can have on our society. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to have it, be lights in this world. Thank you so much for all the things that you have given to us. Thank you so much, Lord, for the, the fathers and mothers, the husbands and wives, the men and women of our church. And thank you for caring enough about us to give us your instruction regarding our behavior and what it ought to look like in our lives. I pray you'd help us to read it and to heed it in our lives, and then to rejoice in the fruitfulness of it. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.